Welcome to the Research Reimagine podcast, brought to you by Nottingham Trent University. I'm your host, Helen Darby Dowman, and I'll be inviting some of NTU's brightest minds to explore how their research is helping us to deepen our understanding of the world. From online addictions to transgender rights and sleep disorders, listen as we discuss some of society's most pressing challenges and uncover some of the ways our research is making a difference. We're at a pivotal moment in women's sport. 356 million people tuned in to the women's Euro final last year. With higher television ratings, there comes greater attendance at women's sports games and greater media coverage. Not only that, but more and more brands are investing in teams as sponsorship deals across women's sport have increased 20% year on year. Of course, this is promising to report, but how level is the playing field in reality for women and girls in sport compared to the men's games? Netflix UK recently launched a new powerful documentary entitled Game On, The Unstoppable Rise of Women's Sport. The film addresses the controversial issues and myths that have prevented gender equality in sport, why things are now changing and what the future holds. Directed by women's sport activist Sue Anstess, MBE, the documentary features candid interviews with some of the world's most successful sports stars alongside key sporting moments from events including the UA for Women's Euros and the Rugby World Cup. Also providing expert commentary is Dr Ali Boaz, lecturer in the sociology of sport here at Nottingham Trent University, who we're excited to be joined by in this episode of the podcast. Ali has extensively researched the world of women's sport and I'm going to be talking to her today about her appearance in the documentary and as the Women's FIFA World Cup is starting today I'll also be asking her about the current picture in women's professional football and how we can keep up the momentum that we've seen over the past few years in women's sport. Ali, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Ellen. So let's start with telling us a little bit about how you got involved with the documentary. Yeah, really exciting to be involved in the documentary, actually. Um, So I connected with Sue via the Women's Sport Collective and through kind of social media networks. And she got in touch with me prior to writing her book of the same name, actually. So able to sort of work with her on that and kind of provide some support in terms of sharing kind of academic ideas, I guess, um, which helped her in crafting that book and then um she got in touch and said hoping to create a documentary of the same name would you like to be involved and I said yes and now there's a documentary on Netflix so um really cool to be part of that process. So what was it like actually filming and meeting Sue and also filming on campus? Yeah really um really cool to be involved so uh, the PR team and the NTU sport team actually were really useful in providing kind of access to facilities and making sure we had different options Um, I had no idea what would be required for filming a documentary so just kind of ad hoc spoke to the NTU sport team and, and told them documentary on women's sport can we have some space and then yeah Sue came up with the um director a guy called Jack and then we spent a couple of hours on campus um talking all things women's sport which was really cool uh Sue is absolutely lovely so it's great to be able to kind of connect with her and and talk about some of the stuff we're both really passionate about. And then I'm assuming you've watched it. I have watched it, yeah. <laughs> and, how, and how was that, looking looking at yourself and being involved in that sort of style of documentary? Is it something you'd done before? or? Um, so I had been involved in a documentary before um, on a smaller scale. So um, that was a couple of years ago. So I had already seen myself kind of on TV and found that all very weird. Um, this was slightly bigger scale and... Sue had told me some of the the people that were involved in it, but I think watching the documentary and seeing some really, really significant women in sport, so Claire Boulding, Denise Lewis, et cetera, um, that was almost a a bit of a moment where I was like, wow, this is going to be a really powerful documentary and and very exciting to to be part of that story, I guess. Um, Although it doesn't take away the slight first time watching yourself on TV, cringe, worrying about (laughs) what you've said, but no, very cool. Yeah, I mean, I really enjoyed watching it. It was a, it was a really interesting view, um, and I think you did a fabulous job, as did everybody else. And um, hopefully, a lot of people will get a lot from it. What is it you hope people will get from from watching the documentary? Wanting p- people to engage with some of these really significant issues around women in sport. It's obviously what I'm really passionate about. It's my what I research day in day out. It's what I talk about all the time. So. There's that, there's wanting people to see kind of the story of that. And I think there's a lot of taken for granted about women's involvement in sport as it stands now. 
And I'm a big thing that I'm quite passionate about is making sure that um, people know like the full story. So I think the history of sport it becomes quite important there and and plays into some of these kind of like social social issues now. I guess. Um, I think if I if, if I think broader and some of the feedback I've had from the documentary is that some of those issues translate into into the real world um, outside of the world of sport. And I think that's really significant in starting to unpick some of those challenges that women face in society more broadly and seeing how they're kind of rooted in some of the similar narratives that, that play out in the documentary for sure. So I think that wide reaching impact could be quite significant. The FIFA Women's World Cup is due to start today. So it would be wrong of us not to start talking a little bit about that. I mean, what are your thoughts on it starting? I mean, have we seen much change in the in the women's sporting landscape and, and are there um, changes that we might see in within this new World Cup? We have seen incredible changes in the, the women's sporting landscape. I think even if we just look back one year, two years from the last World Cup in 2019, there's this real narrative of growth, of progress that we see in women's sport um, really playing out. So I think the 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 2023 Women's World Cup is going to be the biggest women's sport event that's ever happened, for sure. And that will, the next one, will, the next event, will, will see the same title. I think we'll continue to see this growth. There's been some real significant things in the run-up to this World Cup. So FIFA are on a path to equalising pay and working towards um, female athletes getting kind of increased reimbursement for their involvement. That's huge. Um Media coverage is, is going to be bigger and better than ever before. So I think there's there's loads of kind of positives to build from um, that we've seen from the 2019 World Cup that we're definitely going to see progress in 2023. And talk to me a little bit about that media coverage and kind of what extra media coverage and exposure in turn, the impact that it has on uh, the women's sporting landscape. Media coverage of women's sport generally, but especially women's football has gone through the roof in the last few years. Um, there's been lots of research that's documented that growth, but specifically research that's been funded by the Women's Sports Trust has really highlighted the importance of that growth. And the knock-on effect of that growth, if we stick within the realm of, of sport, has seen increased sponsorship opportunities, increased business opportunities for, for women in sport, increased um, opportunity to work in the world of women's sport, more jobs, etc. So there's been a real impact within sport that we've seen that goes hand in hand with that media growth and and then again that kind of cycles around so then we see increased performances because there's more staff and more time dedicated and a better pathway to performance so then the tv companies want to cover it more and it, and so on so we see how that grows i think the growth of media coverage of women's sport again similar to some of those ideas from the documentary can have a real positive impact on not just girls in sport, so we've got the whole, the creation of role models and, and the visibility of women doing these activities for, for girls watching that on TV is huge and, and not something I had growing up for sure. Um, and I think that's something that's really special that kind of girls of today can see those career opportunities in sport. And then I also think that that has a knock-on effect around how girls see the capabilities of their bodies and of what they can achieve in a much broader realm than just the world of sport, I think. So, yeah, I have lofty ambitions for um, not just this World Cup, but I think the increasing presence of women in, within sporting landscapes that um, transcends the world of sport for sure. I mean, let's talk about the role model aspect of it a little bit and maybe... Obviously, it, trans it translates beyond television and, and, say, what we would see in the papers, doesn't it? Yes, definitely. I think having role models for girls in sport is is central in encouraging engagement, in increasing participation within PE and all those things. And we all know that the the links between PE and physical activity and health and mental health and self-belief and, and all those ideas that I think we really want to be encouraging girls in sport, uh, girls to be engaging in sport. And I think having role models, the lionesses, the, the best players in the world, um, much more visible and much more present is is really important. And I guess by that extra exposure of television coverage, um, which has increased massively, as you've already said, and we will expect to see obviously a lot more at this World Cup. And it'll probably be the biggest one until the next World Cup, which you've definitely said before. Um, I guess by creating those role models, 
that that actually moves beyond television into their their like heroes in their own right that then that translates over into social media and so forth yeah definitely we're seeing um women's sports or women athletes as celebrities as um real leaders in in society i guess so even just watching wimbledon just gone we saw um in the royal box you're seeing female athletes alongside the male athletes that we've always seen there so I think you're starting to see much more parity I think between men and women's sport in that regard now whether or not female athletes want to be celebrities or want the additional pressure of being role models or being sort of heavily followed on social media that's probably you know much more intricate conversation I guess but I think yeah it's really quite something to have such visible so many visible female sporting role models when I think historically we've probably only had one or two kind of real standouts I mean but it's still not entirely a level playing field is it and uh, why is it why is that why is it still this disparity today between the men's and women's game yeah no it's not a level playing field (laughs) there's lots of loads of positive narratives but if you're going on a point in comparison, it's by no means level at all. Um, and I think I, I kind of alluded to this when talking about the documentary, the influence that history has on how things exist today like can't be underestimated, I think. Um, if we take football, for example, even in the UK, we're all well-versed in the in the, foot, the women's football ban. I think it's, it's never kind of had so much... Um, been sort of front and centre so much than, than the last few years and, and people starting to make sense of. I think it's because people are asking questions like now we're seeing women's football on TV and it's engaging with fans of sport that haven't followed women's football. They don't know the history and the stories and, and they're starting to ask the questions. Why is it that the women's footballers aren't on TV as much or they're not in the newspapers as much or we don't know much about them or they've only been professional, fully professional for five or six years? And I think people starting to ask those questions leads us to having to tell the, the full story, I guess. So, um, yeah, the, the impact of history weighs heavy, I think, on, on women's sport more generally. And that's something that the more you draw attention to it, I think the easier it is for us to start to go, OK, we need to start unpicking some of that and start making the right, right kind of changes for women's involvement. Ali, I know you're really interested in the history and you've done a lot of research into that. For our listeners, will you give us a bit of your insight, that extra knowledge that perhaps we, the rest of us don't actually have? For context, I'm not a sports historian, so any sports historians, they're banging the radios. This is not me proclaiming to be a sports historian, but as part of my research, which is very much around kind of current issues in professional women's sport and, and how we can make sense of those issues, that obviously involves looking back at research that's been done into the history of women's sports. So um, some very kind of famous sports historians, one in particular, Jennifer Hargreaves, wrote a a particularly important book that I used during my PhD called Sporting Females. And she really tracked the the kind of history of, it's very much a history of like white middle-class women in sport in the UK. So it's a, a, you might say a, a snapshot of a particular era I guess but she talks quite heavily about the the role of um going back to the 19th century how men had all the the sort of power within society and that translated into education education being one of the the most obvious pathways for men to get involved in sport during that period and that's as the the sports history books will tell us that's how sports became codified and um formalised competitions kind of originated out of the the public school pathway and then the university pathway which was dominated by men then we the the knock-on effect of that is that the people that are making the rules and formalising the sport and engaging with the sport are men now the a significant moment for women in sport has been the interwar years so 1914 to 1918 lots of men in the UK go off and fight in the first world war and women then take their place in the in the kind of munitions factories etc part of those factories had football teams women t- took part in those football teams it, cut a long story short organized sporting organizations didn't like women's involvement in sport banned women playing football for 50 years and and then we get to 1971 and 
women are allowed to play football again and then we wonder why <laughs> there's a very short history of women's involvement in the game and and why we haven't seen I guess the investment in the game or women in those positions of um, decision making positions and I think that only makes sense when you know the, the full story. So moving into like the, the the picture now obviously we do have professional female football stars I mean what what is the landscape like for them you know what are still the challenges you know and the positives so some of the more contemporary issues I guess for women as professional athletes has been mainly because sports they've been the place of men I guess so some kind of challenges that have been addressed in recent years have been around um, equal pay so most famously by the US Women's National Team, but that's translated into a a global discussion. And there are still issues in terms of women playing at the very highest level, whether they get paid or not. Some recent research by FIFA Pro, which is the football's players' union, has highlighted that um, countries involved in kind of World Cup qualifying, a third of those teams didn't pay their, their players. And so there are still issues at the very highest level of the game around payment, um... And then kind of issues related to contract regulations, so maternity, that's been a a recent addition, I guess, into the contracts of female athletes um, who play full-time and and play professionally that had been, I guess, overlooked. And it's not something that women in working in other industries have have had to uh, navigate, I guess, in the 21st century. So, yeah, still definitely still challenges, um, for women working in professional sport. I mean, does the ownership and management of football and women's sport in general affect its success? Oh, big question. Yeah, I think it does. Um, And the the kind of structure of, or the the kind of management and organisation structure of women's football has changed over years. So there was a Women's Football Association, then the, the Football Association, which was the Men's Football Association, but we obviously don't precursor men's sport with the word men. Um, The Football Association then amalgamated with the Women's Football Association, which um, actually meant kind of took over it. Um, And there's a, I know there's an academic at Bournemouth, Raph Nicholson, who's doing some work on kind of the mergers of women's sports organisations with male sports organisations and the challenges of that, because often it means the women's just get submerged into the men's organisation and everything carries on as normal. So the organisation and structure of women's sport and women's football definitely impacts on how it exists. Um, I can't probably speak too much around like ownership of clubs and stuff because it's a very complicated landscape. Some clubs exist in their own right. Some clubs have in more recent years become part of um, what you might class a bigger men's club. Um, Some clubs have got really extensive histories. Some clubs are are very new creations, I guess, by the men's team who perhaps notice that women are are playing football as well and and address that. So, yeah, it's a complicated landscape. So taking that kind of ownership and management, does it also play out in the media um, and the way that women's uh, sport is covered? Yes, definitely. Um, There's been a wealth of research on media coverage of women's sport and using men's sport as a point of comparison and the women as athletes have been kind of problematized by the media for sure in terms of being sexualized and um, the types of language that they use to talk about uh, women athletes has has been really problematic. Um, Men's sport has always been seen as the, the kind of standard I guess to which women's sport has been compared against or even just I mean I, I touched upon it earlier the fact that we have like sport pages and we have women's sport Um, and we never used to have women's sport pages so that's really positive but we don't have men's sport pages and women's sport pages we have the sport section and in that we have the women's sport section so I think you can see some of those some of those age-old challenges play out in so many different ways Um, and we definitely see that in terms of media coverage now media coverage is is improving immensely for women's sport and it's a really kind of exciting place to be and to and to see how much that's improved but that same as as lots of things it doesn't mean that we're at we've like hit the the gold standard and we're doing everything right or, or media companies are doing everything right and I think there is still kind of useful points of comparison between how we see men's sport 
and how people see women's sport at various levels in, in its mediated form um, that we can, can kind of unpick, I guess. When it comes to coverage on television, um, there is still... It is different, isn't it? We don't. We're not say, seeing the same quality potentially, or production qualities anyway, put into female games as we do into male games. And how problematic is that to the viewers and what they're actually observing and seeing? Yeah, um, it's definitely again, it's an improving space, and I think the coverage of the Women's World Cup will be the best coverage we've ever seen of women's football, and it will have excellent analysis and various bits, but. I think the challenge is how does that translate across the landscape of women's sport? So is the same kind of production value and and time and uh, expenditure, I guess, put into women's sport across the board? Um, women Events such as a Women's World Cup take place once every four years and they're going to be like the, the kind of flagship, this is the best that it can be. Um, but we want or the me- media companies or people who fans of women's sport, people involved in women's sport, want people watching and engaging with and supporting women's sport over the, the whole calendar year and over the four-year World Cup cycle. So I guess the challenge is to make sure that the coverage of women's sport at, at lots of levels looks and feels really thought through and valuable. I think there's been examples in recent years where that probably hasn't been the case. Um and there's a, a fine line between having visibility and wanting eyes on sport and wanting people to to see that it exists and see see what it looks like. But then do we want them to watch it if it doesn't look very good? Because if we're trying to engage a, a body of fans within, sports fans with, with kind of new versions of sport, which they that might be how they, how they understand it, watching, I don't know, a, a women's rugby match or a women's netball match or whatever, and maybe the production of that isn't the the kind of shiniest and, and best example of kind of sports coverage. Is that going to have a detrimental effect to fans of the game? I don't know. So it's a ve- it's a, a grey area, I'd say, between balancing wanting visibility, wanting it to to have reach, and wanting it to get beyond people who turn up and, and get in, pay the, the five pound for a ticket, and and whatever else. But do you want it if it's not? If it's not the the shiny format, do we want that to be the the version of women's sport that people watch? So yeah, it's a balancing act, I think, and it's something that I guess media companies and are working through, and researchers like myself are, are criticizing and, and calling out. So some of the some of the coverage can be seen as a little bit patronizing with the use of the language and the way it's been talked about the female game. Can you talk to us a little bit about that and some of the challenges that we've seen in recent times? Yeah, definitely. Um, it's one thing that researchers have called out quite a lot in, ter- in terms of the coverage of women's sport, whether that's uh, TV or, or kind of print media coverage. It's something we've seen quite a lot in in how journalists write about women's sport. It can be quite patronising. We see words such as uh, girls. We see something that's been probably quite unique to women's sport has been like a real lack of criticism of it. So it's almost like, oh, the girls are playing sport and oh, they won, like fantastic. Aren't they great role models for girls? Or maybe they didn't win, but they're still great role models for girls because they're out there trying and and that kind of kind of notion. Um, and, and something that I guess journalists are, have, have definitely shifted onto and academics are, are paying attention to is that if we want women's sport to be seen as sport just played by women not played by men then we need to talk about it as sport and we and people have lots of opinions on sport about what's good and what's not good and and I think that's been a a really interesting shift some research that's just been published this year actually or this this last couple of weeks by led by Stacey Pope at Durham University has has tracked the kind of media coverage of or the print media coverage of women's football from the last two World Cup cycles and something that that research team has drawn upon and, and noticed is a real shift in that kind of language. So we are seeing less use of the word girls and ladies and more criti- more criticism, more action shots of women playing sport instead of... One thing we've seen rec- in recent years around uh, women athletes is if there's like a moment of real extreme emotion 
a loss in a final or a, win, a medal win, you, you quite often see women like static but crying, whether that's tears of joy or tears of sadness, it'd be like tears and quite up close. Whereas you see more, if you do the comparison to men's sport, you see like the big celebrations and and it portrays the, the notion that women are just these emo, really emotional and that's something that's shifted and something that Stacey Pope's research has kind of pointed to, that shift in kind of imagery and language, which is really positive. Yeah, it's showing the actual real sporting landscape rather than picking on the, the gender difference. Yes, definitely, definitely. And so will women's football ever mirror the men's game, do you think? And another question, I suppose, to that, to add on to it is, and actually, do we want it to? Do you know what? It's a big point of contention, I think, from people working in in the sports world, people writing about it. Um, there's always been a pressure on female athletes to do things differently. So there's the expectation that if you go and watch a women's football match, they'll stay behind and talk to the fans. We never have that expectation of male players, but we expect it of female players. And the more people go to games and the more games that they have and the more that they're on TV and the more they become celebrities, that expectation becomes harder for them to manage. So we're probably going to start to see a point where the, f the players don't stay behind after a game for hours signing every single little girl's football shirt because at the minute that might be at a, at a WSL game, that might be a couple of thousand. One day that's going to be 20,000. So how long can the girls stay and sign shirts for? And then you're going to see the, the discussions, oh, well, lost touch with the fans and just like the male players, you don't have access to them. But should like should we have access to them anyway? They're, they're just really good at football doing their job. And I think there's a, a real, I guess, grey area, as I've said, around lots of things to do with women's sport, around what our expectations are of female athletes what women's sport looks like now and the direction it's going, we only have men's sport to follow, I guess. So the challenge for women's sport is how do we do things differently and what bits do we want to do differently? And we definitely do want to do bits differently, for sure. Um, and there are some real pioneers in the world of women's sport that are, are kind of pushing for that to be the case. Um, but then we're also, on you know, on the other hand, we're pushing for things that because we want what the men have got, so we do want equal pay and we do want equal conditions and we do want equal media coverage so yeah I definitely think that we we don't want to mirror men's sport I think it's really hard to not mirror men's sport because that's the only example we can follow um, but it does give those working in women's sport a, a useful touch point to go okay well you know if we're going to make these changes or make this progress maybe it needs to look slightly different to what we've seen before so a grey answer for a grey area I guess I find it quite interesting as well. You know, you do see this criticism of men's sport so occasionally with, oh, you know, the women just do it so brilliantly. You know, we wish we could see this, particularly with the football, isn't it? With that. I mean, just flipping the question a little bit as in, is, is that fair? Good question. Probably not. I think they're worlds apart. Elite level men's football, Premier League, is, a, a diff is in a different stratosphere to elite level women's football. So... It's a, a really difficult position to pitch them against each other. I think he's setting both sides up to fail, unfortunately, um, by doing that. Because at the point we're at with women's football, they are those inspirational role models. Now, I think we can be... On the one hand, I buy into that. I think it's amazing that girls have got these role models and role models that I never had and, and all the rest of it. But what a pressure to place on a group of young women, 20, 30-something women, who just want to be really good at football, probably. And I'm sure they do want to inspire the, gener the next generation. And they openly say that. And they, they had the letter after the Euros about girls doing football in PE. And But, like, can we expect that of them? Probably not. In the same way, we don't expect that of, of male athletes. But... Then we also have some incredible male athletes who who use their sh their platform for real social justice issues. Marcus Rashford being the most obvious. But then does that mean everyone else that who's not Marcus Rashford is not doing a good job of using their? It, it's such a uh, yeah. I don't envy the elite athletes navigating the minefield of what do they chip in with, what do they not, how many autographs do they stay behind and sign, and those kind of things when I think they just want to get on with stuff. 
I mean, one of the bits in the documentary was there was a there was a conversation as well about the fact that obviously the Premier League, when it was created, made mistakes because it was new, and that actually they we have the opportunity with women's football to to actually learn from those mistakes. So that's probably quite important to to acknowledge as well that actually. You know, we, we've got for women's sport, we want to achieve and, and get so many equal levels that we've got with the men. But actually, there's a lot that can be learned and improved on. Yeah, there's lots that we can learn from, I guess, some of the challenges we've seen in men's sport, whether that's Premier League. I think men's elite rugby has given us some useful examples of maybe things that we don't want to do in women's sport. And I think it's a relates I guess to what I was saying in terms of how important history is in understanding women's sport I think you definitely have to take lessons from what we've seen in men's sport and and their professionalization processes and some of the challenges that they've had to navigate I think even stuff that's kind of pertinent now so probably with elite football one of the big conversations is around gambling sponsors and some of the challenges around gambling within sport and the role that sport plays in promoting that. And I think that's maybe a, an interesting space where women's sport go, okay, well, actually, do you know what? We're not going to be part part of that conversation. Now, that's obviously a, a pie in the sky idea and, you know, money talks as, as well. So it's maybe not a space where women's sport can push back on, but it gives useful examples, I guess, of for organisations involved in women's sport to go, okay, well, what? where are we going to, kind of what path are we going to follow and, and where we're going to veer off. I think that's a, a useful point of, point to learn from. So finally, what changes do you think we'll see and or what do we need to see? Something that I think is really important to the, the kind of landscape of women's sport is seeing more equal representation in positions of power. Something that I think is really important... Um, I think lots of how culture works in organisations is top top down and it's easier to make changes from the top. So I think if organisations demonstrate that they value a diverse body of opinions, and this spans all kind of EDI conversations, I guess, but if they can make that statement at the top and that filter down, I think that's going to contribute to kind of cultural change. I think lots of where we're at, within the world of women's sport is left to, is now looking at the, the small bits, I guess. So people who are new to, to following women's sport might go, okay, well, this is amazing because we're on the pathway to equal pay in football and we've got women's sport on TV and we've got women athletes, celebrities, and it's never been better. So now it's the small stuff. So like now we're realising that, oh, there's never been women football, women footballers with uh, specially made boots before and loads of female footballers actually wear kids boots because men's football boots don't go as small as the average women's foot size so now we're like okay well we need to start looking at the, the technology involved in sport and how we understand women as athletes so it's the smaller bits now because we have made the big strides women are allowed to do sport and women are doing it in their millions and we are watching it on TV and we don't think it's weird that it's on TV. So now it's like, what are the, the little kind of sm- smaller moving parts, I guess. And my take on that is if we have more women involved in decision-making positions and those decisions get made. If we had women in charge of sports science departments and running sports science labs, we probably would have had more research done on sports bras and female specific sports kit and football boots and nutrition practices for female athletes perhaps so I think it's the cultural stuff I guess which is for me is lots of small little pieces that we have to chip away at I guess. Ali thanks so much for joining us today and giving us an insight into the world of women's sport beyond what we see in mainstream media. No it's been really enjoyable thank you for having me. If you'd like to find out more about Ali's work please have a look in the episode description. You've been listening to the Research Reimagine podcast by Nottingham Trent University. For all of the latest news from the research community at NTU, follow us on Twitter at NTU underscore research or sign up to our research newsletter by visiting ntu.ac.uk forward slash research. Thanks for listening.